Lesson 4. Lesson 4 will be split into two different parts, going over implementation details. Specifically in this lesson, we are going to understand the design principles and learn the implementation details of some modules so that you can work successfully in LAVI communications with the LTE application framework. Specifically, we're going to cover architectural things like the host and FPGA partitioning. We're going to do an overview of the host code, an overview of the FPGA code, a recap of clock-driven logic, which is fundamental to programming the application framework, and finally discuss the interfaces between the host and FPGA code. In section A, we will cover the partitioning between the host and the FPGA code. At an overview level, these are the types of functionalities that are implemented on the host versus what is implemented on the FPGA. Realize that the host and the FPGA have different processing limitations, and hence we are very deliberate about what we use on the FPGA to leverage its real-time capabilities and what we put onto the host. The host code is going to have our graphical user interface, enable us to control RF settings and LTE parameters, enable us to display system statuses such as spectrum, constellation, and throughput, and also allow us to communicate with external data sources and syncs such as through a UDP socket. The FPGA is going to have the brunt of the signal processing, all the digital IQ baseband processing, the channel encoding and decoding, the OFDM modulation and demodulation, and the synchronization, channel estimation, and equalization are all implemented on the FPGA. This is a simplified block diagram of the downlink on the transmitter side. In this, we can track the flow of both data and configuration information. From this, we can see that we can get a data source through UDP to the host. The host side will then handle system parameters, the PDCCH and the DCI messages, and the PDSCH data. Note that the system parameters are used to configure the PDCCH encoding on the FPGA, while the PDCCH and the DCI message are used to configure the PDSCH encoding on the FPGA. Data flows from the PDCCH and the DCI message to the PDCCH encoding, and from the PDSCH data goes to the PDSCH encoding, as you would expect, both of which are on the FPGA as mentioned. In addition, you can see that the CRS and the UERS, in addition to the PSS, are all first created and implemented on the FPGA and then combined in the resource mapper on the FPGA. And then finally, we go through the OFDM modulation, including the IFFT and the cyclic prefix edition. And then finally, to our digital to analog converter, which then leads to the RF. After the downlink transmitter, which was covered on the previous slide, we of course have the downlink receiver. And this is the simplified block diagram of the downlink receiver. Our signal comes in through our RF front end and then goes through the analog to digital converter. Then we have a synchronization block, including carrier frequency offset compensation, which we will cover later. Then we have our FFT and the rest of the OFDM demodulation, and then the resource demapper. Again, all of this is happening on the FPGA in real time. Then the signal goes to uh, the channel estimation and equalization using CRS, which then sends PDCCH information to the PDCCH decoder. The PDCCH decoder then configures the PDSCH decoder. Note that the PDSCH decoder could be fed either from the channel estimation and equalization CRS block, or it is possible to switch to actually use channel estimation and equalization UERS on the PDSCH decoder. Um, the PDCCH always uses CRS, but again, it is possible to switch so that you use the UERS for the PDSCH or for the data channel as shown on the slide. So you have that option. Finally, the PDCCH decoder goes to the PDCCH DCI message on the host, and the PDSCH decoder sends its status to the PDSCH decoder status indicator on the host and sends the data to the PDSCH data sync on the host, which can then be sent to UDP. So at a high level, most of the signal processing, the synchronization, the OFDM demodulation, the resource demapping, and the channel estimation and equalization and decoding all happen on the FPGA. And as you can see on the receiver side, 
you have a few options in terms of how the data channel gets decoded. And then on the host side, we basically re read the data and read the status. As we saw on the previous two simplified block diagrams, we are sending data between the host and the FPGA many times within the application framework. This slide provides a review of the different ways we can actually transfer data between the host and the FPGA. At a high level, there are two different ways to pass data between the host and the FPGA. One is slow and just provides the latest data information, and one is fast and streams all data losslessly. The first method is using controls and indicators in LabVIEW. As mentioned, this is slow and just passes the latest data. What this looks like on the FPGA is either a LabVIEW control or indicator as pictured on the slide. In this case, operation select would be a control on the FPGA that is going to read the latest data from the host, whereas loop iteration is an indicator on the FPGA, which is going to update whenever it get call, gets called in the code and the host is going to read whatever that latest value is. On the host side for controls and indicators, you're going to have a node that you drop down that is called a read write FPGA control. From this node, you can specify which control or indicator you want to write to or read from. And then anytime this node gets called, you will read the latest data from the FPGA. The controls and indicators are used for control data to the FPGA such as the modulation encoding scheme or the physical resource block allocation, or to send status data from the FPGA to the host. The second method is using direct memory access FIFOs or DMA FIFOs. These either come in the flavor of host to target or H2T FIFOs, which go from the host down to the FPGA, or target to host FIFOs, which go from the FPGA up to the host. As mentioned, these are fast and stream all data losslessly until the FIFO overflows. On the FPGA, what this looks like is you'll have FIFO read nodes and FIFO write nodes. And then on the host, you'll similarly have FIFO read and FIFO write nodes. And then from within each of these blocks, you can specify the specific name of the FIFO that you are writing to or reading from. The DMA FIFOs are used to actually pass payload data to the FPGA PDSCH status and data to the host, and to stream spectrum delay to the host. In summary, there are two ways to pass data between the host and the FPGA. There is a slow method to pass the latest data either from the host to the FPGA or from the FPGA to the host. And then there's the fast method that streams data to go from the FPGA to the host or from the host to the FPGA. So as you design your code, you just need to consider whether you need to stream all data or whether periodic updates are relevant. Exercise 4.1, transferring data between the host and the FPGA. In this exercise, you will learn how to create your own FIFO, use the FIFOs to write data to the FPGA, use the FIFOs to read data from the FPGA, and actually run this in a simulation so you can see how this behaves immediately before going through any lengthy FPGA compiles. As with the previous exercises, we will walk through the directions in the slides and then show a demo of this happening in Labby Communications. These are the directions you're going to follow in this exercise. If you get stuck, since a lot of this is new, feel free to continue on to the next slide in which we actually give you the solution on how to do this. But these are the steps you're going to go through. You're going to open and familiarize yourself with exercise 41-1, create the required FIFO resources in the project, complete the FPGA VI, complete the host VI, and then actually run the simulation. All right, so this is how you're actually going to go and do this. In the left rail, create a new resource file and open it. You can do this from the files pane and then hitting the plus button, and then going to add new shared resource collection. This is the file that allows you to specify certain resources like clocks and FIFOs. In System Designer, drag this resource file to the FPGA. Then go ahead and open this resource file. From the resource file, go to the FIFO section and select Create New. We're going to create two host-to-target FIFOs and one target-to-host FIFO. To actually specify the FIFO type, you select the new FIFO that you created and then go to the right rail to configure it. 
name them something simple like A, B, and C, respectively. Go back to System Designer and click on the FPGA VI that already exists on the target. In the right rail, ensure that the build output is set to bit file. We will show you what this is going to look like on the next slide, but this is essentially what we are going to do to create our FPGA VI. If you want a challenge, try and create this yourself before looking at the solution on the next slide. What we're going to need to do is create new constants for each of the three FIFO references. by using a FIFO constant from the palettes. These end up having little drop-down icons that we can use to select the three FIFOs that we created, A, B, and C. Then we're going to wire the arithmetic operations to do some addition and subtraction, and wire the handshaking from the FIFO read and write nodes such that the output will only accept data when there is a valid input. This is what the solution will actually look like on the FPGA. What we have here is one clock-driven loop, which is the blue loop around the code. This loop is going to run at the clock rate data clock, which we specified with the data clock clock constant going into the clock input on the upper left-hand corner of the loop. Then we dropped down a read FIFO, another read FIFO, and a write FIFO node, and then wired the FIFO reference wire to each of those to specify which FIFO is going to be read from or written to. Here we can see that we created our FIFO constants so that we read from our host to target FIFO A and our host to target FIFO B. That data then either gets subtracted or added depending on the operation that we select. And then we write the data to target to host FIFO C. The next thing we need to do is actually follow the handshaking wires. We can see that there's an output valid Boolean wire coming from both read FIFO nodes and then an AND. So if both FIFOs provide a valid output, then write FIFO will actually write the data coming into FIFO C. Now let's look at what the host VI will look like. As I mentioned previously, I will show a demo of how to do this once we finish the slides. If you go to the host VI, we need to first add functionality to start all our FIFOs. We're going to have an open FPGA, FPGA VI reference, and then three start DMA FIFOs, one for A, one for B, one for C. To actually configure the FIFO that we start or read or write from later, you select the specific start DMA FIFO block go to the right rail, and then under General, choose the name of the FIFO. Once we finish the initialization part on the host, let's actually add functionality to write the FIFOs. First, what we need to do is make sure to convert our scalar input variables into arrays. It's a good idea to write chunks of data at a time to the FPGA, such as 1,000 elements at a time, based on the implementation of the DMA FIFO. In the same host VI, we're then going to actually read the output variable from the FIFO. And in this case, what we decided to do is show the first element of the array. Note here what we do is we have an input A that we write to DMA FIFO A and an input B that we write to DMA FIFO B. In each case, we're sending a thousand elements of A and a thousand elements of B. It's a fairly simple example. And then finally, we're going to read the DMA FIFO C. Note that we have two read DMA FIFO blocks. The first block reads how much data is actually on FIFO C without pulling any of that data off the FIFO. Then the second block reads all the data from DMA FIFO C using the output from the first block. So the first block does not read any data and tells us how much data is left on the FIFO. And the second block reads all of that data. This is a common trick that we use in LabVIEW when reading data from a FIFO coming from an FPGA. Now, from the host VI, run the simulation with the Run button in the upper left-hand corner. Because the host VI has the open FPGA VI reference and start DMA FIFO blocks, the host VI will actually start and simulate the FPGA VI for you.
In both the host and FPGA VI, place a node at the respective loop counts to compare the values of the probes with the values on the GUI. What do we learn? What you will see is that the FPGA runs really fast, even in simulation. We can also see evidence that the read-write nodes are a lossy way to transfer data. If we actually look at the loop iterations that were run on the host, we see that they were run 136 times, whereas the FPGA loop ran 481,000 times. That's why we use something like FIFOs to actually stream data losslessly and buffer data between the two targets running at different speeds, whereas the read-write nodes are sufficient for configuration and status type of information. Now that we have discussed host and FPGA partitioning and have an idea of how we actually get data from the host to the FPGA and from the FPGA to the host, let's look at the full LTE application framework host code to see at a high level what it does. First, let's start at the high level in terms of the general structure that we're going to see. We're first gonna have an initialization part that configures the hardware, deploys bit files to the hardware, etc. Then we're gonna have the main part of our program, which is gonna be a set of eight different loops running in parallel, doing different tasks continuously. And then finally, when the code is actually stopped, we're gonna have some cleanup code to close up all our references nicely. This is the general structure. If we actually look at what these loops look like, we can see that we have eight loops running in parallel. What this means in LabVIEW is that we have eight loops that are actually going to be parallel tasks, processes, or threads that are going to run in parallel. LabVIEW on the host takes care of assigning each of these processes or threads to individual separate cores on your PC so that you can leverage the multi-core processing capabilities. These eight loops have these separate eight different functionalities. In the LCE host downlink GVI, we have a loop that configures the baseband and RF hardware. We have a loop that configures our automatic gain control and PDSCH. We have a loop to plot PSD and constellation. We have a loop to calculate and plot throughput and BLER. We have a loop to send dynamic UE configuration, transmit, and RX data. We have a loop to read from the UDP port and write to the FPGA. We have a loop to read from the FPGA and write to UDP. And we have a loop that configures streams from the FPGA. So let's go ahead and look at this and the LTE application framework. In this next exercise, go ahead and understand the structure of the host code. Open an instance of the LTE application framework by going to the lobby and then projects, scrolling down to application frameworks, and then choosing either version, depending on if you have a Flex Rio or USRP Rio, as we did in a previous exercise. Open the diagram of the host top VI, LTE host downlink.gvi, and identify the structures that were described on the previous slide. Note the function of each individual loop. What this will help you do is if you need to do a specific thing, you can figure out which loop to go to on the host to actually find that functionality. In section C, we will go through an overview of the FPGA code in the LTE application framework so you can understand how the different functionality we previously described is organized in the code. Recall that there are two different options or system configurations. The first option is when the enode B and the UE are on separate FPGAs, while the second option is when the UE and the enode B are on the same FPGA, but only the downlink is implemented. In this case, we have three different FPGA bit files and therefore three different FPGA VIs. For sake of simplicity, we're just going to look at what the FPGA VI looks like in the downlink. But the same general structure and organization applies to all three different FPGA VIs. Now let's look at what the transmit path looks like on the FPGA VI in the downlink VI. This is what the actual FPGA VI looks like at a high level. You'll notice that it is divided into four different loops, which are the blue squares. Each of these loops in an FPGA VI is called a clock domain. And they are called a clock domain because each one is going to run at a different clock rate on the FPGA 
First, let's look at what each of these loops do, and then we can actually trace the transmit path in this FPGA VI. The top loop is in charge of low-level front-end configuration, and more than likely, you won't have to ever actually do anything to change this loop. The second loop contains both the resampling digital down conversion and the analog to digital converter, in addition to code to talk to the digital to analog converter, the up conversion, and the resampling. The next loop is the digital baseband receiver chain. And the next loop is the digital baseband transmitter chain. Now let's look at how the actual transmit path is traced through the FPGA. This is what it looks like. The host side is going to send data to a host to target FIFO, and the digital baseband transmit chain clock domain is going to read that host to target FIFO. In the digital baseband transmit chain loop, we implement all the transmitter functionality that we described previously. The transmitter minimac, the PDCCH encoding, the PDSCH encoding, resource mapping, and the inverse Fourier transform and cyclic prefix insertion. This modulated data is then sent via an inter FPGA FIFO to the loop that has the digital analog converter, the up conversion, and the resampling. And then finally, this data is sent to an IO node, which sends our data through the RF front end and to our antenna eventually. When we go from the digital baseband transmit loop to the digital to analog converter, up conversion and resampling loop, we have a resampling that occurs that takes us from 30.72 megahertz to either 120 megahertz for a USRP Rio with 40 megahertz of bandwidth, 200 megahertz for a USRP Rio with 120 megahertz of bandwidth, or 160 megahertz of bandwidth, and 130 megahertz for a flex radio and a front end adapter module. This accounts for the different sampling rates of each of the digital to analog converters. Now let's look at the receive path on the FPGA. Again, we are working with the exact same FPGA VI, so these are all the same loops that we saw earlier. The low level front end configuration loop, the loop that talks to the ADC and the DAC, the digital baseband RX chain, and the digital baseband transmit chain. Now, based on what we saw on the previous slide, you might be able to guess what the receive path actually looks like in this code. And this is what it looks like. We have our data that comes in from the antenna to the RF front end, and then through an IO node to the part of the loop that deals with resampling, down conversion, and the analog to digital conversion. Specifically in this loop, we have impairments corrections to deal with impairments from the RF front end. We also resample from whatever the rate is that the ADC is running down to 30.72 megahertz. An inter FPGA FIFO goes from this loop to the digital baseband receive chain loop. In this loop, we have all the functionality that we described previously. The synchronization based on the PSS, radio frame alignment, cyclic prefix removal and the FFT, channel equalization, resource demapping, the PDCCH decoding, and the PDSCH decoding. After all this processing, we have a target to host FIFO that streams our decoded data to the host. Now let's do exercise 422 and understand the structure of the FPGA code ourselves. Go back to the instance of the LT application framework that you opened, but this time open the diagram for the FPGA top level VI LTE FPGA USRP Rio 40 MHz bandwidth downlink.gvi and identify the structures as described on the previous slides. Follow the data control paths and find the places where the data is written to and read from FIFOs so you can follow the flow of data to the FPGA and between clock domains. Section D, Clock Driven Logic. We're going to do a quick summary of how clock-driven logic programming works from what is in the extended logic communications training course. If you want more details beyond what is in this course, feel free to refer to the guided help tutorials in Lavi communications, sign up for the course, or reach out to your local support so that they can help you answer questions by emailing support at ni.com. As mentioned previously, Clock-driven logic is the low-level FPGA language in LAVI communications. Clock-driven logic gives you explicit control over not only the samples, but also 
how they work with respect to the clock. In other words, all the pipelining and latency type of information. Clock-driven logic specifically then can be used on the FPGA. You can either create a .gcdl sub block or from an FPGA VI, write that code within a clock-driven loop. An important concept when programming FPGAs and when specifically working with clock-driven logic is the concept of the critical path. It is important to note that all the logic within one clock domain must execute within one clock cycle. The FPGA compiler will fail to meet this desired timing if the logical path is too long. In other words, if the critical path is too long. This is because when it actually generates the bit stream that goes on the FPGA, and tries to route between different logic elements, it might not be able to do so in the time that is specified by the clock. To fix this, users can do what is called inserting pipelining to relax the timing. If you relax the timing, the FPGA compiler has a higher chance of success to compile at a specific target frequency. To do this type of pipelining, you implement shift registers between each of the blocks. It's often considered best practice to add this feedback note or shift register at the end of each module. However, it is important to note that each pipelining stage introduces latency. Typically, what we recommend is you implement the actual logic of your block first, so you confirm that it functionally works as expected, and then move on to inserting pipelining. Now, you have many different tools at your disposal when working with clock-driven logic. It is important to also note what is not supported. Uh, specific data types are not supported, such as floating point and multidimensional arrays, though multidimensional array support will be coming in future versions of LabVIEW communications. Also, for loops and while loops within a clock-driven loop are not supported in clock-driven logic, though for loops can be used in the optimized FPGA VI feature that we will not be covering right now. The list on the left shows everything that is supported. Different data types, integers, fixed point, and complex fixed point, booleans, one-dimensional arrays with fixed sizes and clusters. You can read from and write to FIFOs. You have a whole host of arithmetic functions and high-throughput math functions available. You have Boolean operations available. There's a rich palette of IP from Xilinx that you can drop down and configure, and case structures to implement state machine logic. Another important concept to understand when working with clock-driven logic is the difference between throughput and latency. Throughput is the rate at which data is produced by a function, whereas latency corresponds to the number of clock cycle it takes from the initial input to the initial output. We can see in the top example that data comes in after the first clock tick but takes two clock ticks to produce the first output. However, after that, we have a new output every clock tick. Therefore, our throughput is one because we have data coming out every clock tick, but we have a latency of two because it takes two initial clock ticks before the first output is produced. In the second example, we can see that we have data produced on the output every other clock tick, and we can see that it takes three clock ticks from the first data coming in to the first output. Therefore, we have a latency of three clock ticks and a throughput of half. The next concept is handshaking. Handshaking is an important part of FPGA programming because all the blocks within one clock domain are running at one clock rate. However, each block might take more than one clock tick to complete. Therefore, to make sure that blocks are only working with valid data and not working with invalid data, blocks must, must handshake with each other to tell each other when inputs are valid and when outputs are valid. Now, there's two types of handshaking that we see when working in the FPGA. One is called two-wire handshaking. In two-wire handshaking, the upstream module indicates if the output sample is valid, and the downstream module uses this signal as an input. So every block sends an output valid out to the next downstream block to the input valid input of the downstream block. 
When you have four wire handshaking, in addition to the first two signals described and two wire handshaking, we additionally add a, a signal where the downstream module indicates if it is ready to accept data from the upstream module. And, the, and finally, the upstream module checks if the downstream module is ready to actually accept that data. Two wire handshaking works when you have explicit knowledge of the latency of each block and so you can account for that in your programming and is simpler in terms of wiring and programming but is more advanced to implement. Four wire handshaking is more simple because all the handshaking is handled by the wires. However, it complicates the implementation of the diagram because now you also have to deal with the upstream handshaking as well. A simple way to remember the difference between two wire handshaking and four wire handshaking is that in two wire handshaking, the next module needs to always be ready to accept data. Whereas in four wire handshaking, the next module tells when it is ready to accept data. So one is implicit and one is explicit. The next important concept with regards to handshaking is when interfacing with AXI IP. AXI streaming is a standard that is used with Xilinx blocks, whereas the handshaking implementation for blocks in Lavi Communications is not the same as the AXI 4S industry standard. This is important because in Lavi Communications, there are a bunch of AXI related blocks on the Xilinx palette. To convert between one and the other, you do so via a logic network, which is covered in the next lesson. However, at a high level, this is the difference. In four wire handshaking in Lavi Communications, output valid means that the data is valid. Ready for input means that the next module is ready to accept data in the next clock cycle. Therefore, your feedback node is in the backwards path, as seen in the diagram at the top. In AXI 4S signals used with Xilinx blocks, MXXX T valid means that data provided by the master is valid. SXXX T ready means that the slave is ready to accept data in the current cycle and your node is in the forward path. You can see the difference in the diagram on the right. The next concept when working with clock-driven logic is how you actually connect your different blocks together. The first option is to use local FIFOs. These FIFOs are just within the FPGA, but you can use them to read from a block and then write to the next block as seen in the loop at the top. While this option works, it can consume a lot of FIFO resources, adds latency, and also can make the implementation more complex. Option three at the bottom is to use four wire handshaking as we discussed. Four wire handshaking means that your designs can become very complicated, but it also means that a lot of the latency is explicitly handled in your design. Option two is block-based processing, which we call our synchronous design. In this case, this requires knowledge of the latency of each block so that you can remove two of the handshaking wires. The block-based operation occurs per OFDM symbol in the example shown here. Um, and this can simplify the design. So there's a lot of different trade-offs you can have to consider when you're implementing your design. In section E, we're gonna discuss the host and FPGA interfaces in more detail. This is the downlink FPGA top level VI that we covered previously. The block highlighted in red is the FPGA timing control. In this case, FPGA timing is master. The downlink transmit chain is triggered by start of TTI event, and the TTI trigger is read onto the host. In other words, the start of TTI event is what triggers the full transmit chain and this originates on the FPGA once all the code is ready to run on the FPGA. This is the sequence of events that occurs in the downlink transmitter in this system. If we look at over time what is happening on the host and the FPGA, you could imagine a timeline where you have to prepare the TTI n minus one, let's say, and then you actually process that TTI n minus one. In our case, what we care about is when the first TTI, prepare TTI n, occurs and when that gets processed, and then all the subsequent 
events. Prepare TTI N gets triggered by TTI trigger N, which happens previous to preparing happening and comes from the FPGA. Then from prepare TTI N, we get dynamic configurations and payload for this first N down to process TTI N. Then TTI trigger N plus one gets triggered and the whole cycle continues. This is what we mean when we say that the FPGA trigger is the master, because the TTI trigger for each TTI comes from the FPGA each time, which allows the host to prepare the TTI and then allows the FPGA to actually process the TTI. In lesson four, section two, we're going to go into detail on specific selected modules. Specifically, we're gonna dive into the channel encoder, resource mapper, and OFDM modulation on the transmitter side, and the synchronization, including the CFO compensation, OFDM demodulation, resource demapping, channel estimation and equalization, and channel decoding on the receiver side. In section A, we will cover channel encoding. Specifically, we will review encoding procedures, discuss the PDCCH convolutional encoder, the PDSCH and the PUSCH turbo encoder, and also the scrambler. As mentioned previously, the LTE standard specifies multiplexing and channel coding and modulation procedures in their respective documents. For the control channel and the data channel, different algorithms are used. For the control channel, we have data preparation, which comes from DCI formatting, we have encoding using convolutional encoding with tail biting. We have rate matching using a par parallel to serial conversion instead of a rate matcher. And then on the modulation side, scrambling using initial values based on subframe indexes and cell ID, and then QPSK to map symbols. For the data channel, we use a mini Mac for data preparation, turbo encoding for encoding and for rate matching, initial values based on subframe index cell ID and RNTI for scrambling, and for modulation to map to symbols QPSK 16 QAM or 64 QAM. If you have been using previous versions of the LTE application framework, note that for the encoding and scrambling, we used to use Xilinx blocks, but now the application framework uses NI implementations for a simpler implementation. This is the convolutional encoder for the PDCCH. In general, the convolutional encoder is very simple. The core functionality are the modulo operations according to the generator polynomials as defined in the LTE standard. Some things to notice, the input bit is a single bit. On the left, we have a seven element Boolean array, which corresponds to the seven bit state of the encoder, in which one bit is the current bit and we have six bits of memory. On the right, we can see that we have a three element Boolean array, which corresponds to a code rate of one over three, or for each input bit, there are two parity bits. Tail biting means that the six registers of the encoder need to be initialized depending on the input code word. In the LTE application framework, this is done with two additional modules, one before and one after the convolutional encoder module. Let's look into these three modules in the next few slides. The first module is LTE DCI encoder tail biting initialization. This module repeats the input vector D sub zero. As you can see, we have our data in and then our data out is the data in repeated. That output then goes into LTE DCI convolutional encoder. This module encodes the input data, producing three output bits for every input bit for an R of one over three. Note that the first and second half of the output sequence is different from the first. This is because at the beginning of C sub X zero, the convolutional encoder is initialized with zeros, while at the beginning of C sub x1, the registers contain the tail biting bits. 
The final block is LTE DCI encoder tail biting. The second half of the signal is encoded with the proper tail biting. This block discards the first unnecessary part of the signal. This concludes the implementation of the PDCCH encoder. This is the PDSCH and PUSCH turbo encoder implementation in the LTE application framework. Remember that for both the downlink and the uplink shared channel or data channel, the same turbo encoder block is used. To make sense of this, refer to the block diagram of what this turbo encoder does per the LTE standard. From this, we can actually see how this is mapped in the diagram. Our data comes in in the left. We have control via state machine in the bottom left and our interleaver. And then we have encoder one and encoder two and our outputs. The diagram ends up being a little bit more difficult to read because we have the aforementioned pipelining implemented to ensure that our design can actually meet timing on the FPGA. However, if you focus on the key blocks, as we've shown here, you can parse out how this has been implemented more clearly. To conclude the channel encoding section, let's now review the scrambler. After the PDSCH and PUSCH channel encoding, in other words, the encoding of the data or shared channel in the downlink and the uplink, the encoded symbols pass through a bit scrambler. The purpose of the scrambler is to make sure the probabilities for a one and a zero are equal, i.e. 0 0.5. This is a major assumption when doing simulations. This is what the scrambler code actually looks like. The input is going to be a U8 and the output is going to be a U8 with the internal state maintained by a U32. Data out is going to be the XOR of data in state one and state two. And then we're going to calculate the next state x1 and calculate the next state x2 with the two blocks seen at the bottom. The next slide shows how to calculate the state of x1 and the state of x2. Also, if you haven't noticed, you can find where these blocks are in the actual project files using the path in the bottom right of all the previous slides. This is what calculate state x1 or calculate state x2 look like. To calculate state x1 and state x2, individual bits of the U32 are combined with XOR gates. This can calculate up to 8 bits in one clock cycle, which is required for 256 QAM. In section B, we will cover resource mapping. We're specifically going to go over the architectural overview, look at the index generator, and the index to channel mapping. So what data is mapped to resource elements? First, we need to look at exactly what the LTE resource grid looks like. If you remember, there are going to be 12 subcarriers per resource block in LTE times 100 total resource blocks for our 20 megahertz wide LTE implementation. This corresponds to 1200 active subcarriers. In the time domain, we have 14 symbols per subframe times 10 subframes per radio frame, which results in 140 symbols. What this means then is we have 168,000 total resource elements in the LTE resource grid. If you recall, the downlink subframe, the special subframe, and the uplink subframe all have different mappings for each of the resource elements, depending on whether it's the control or the data, the data etc. The output cluster from the resource mapper contains the address of the IQ symbol in this overall resource grid. This is the architecture overview of the resource mapper. The resource mapper is made of two primary modules, the index generator and then the index to channel mapper. The index generator is going to give us essentially the address of the IQ symbols in the LTE resource grid. More explicitly, it's going to output a cluster including symbol index, RB index, subframe index, 
subcarrier index, and other booleans for alignment, such as start of subframe, start of symbol, and start of radio frame. The index to channel mapper is then going to explicitly map everything to its specific physical channel. The index to channel mapper does this by outputting a cluster that denotes which physical channel something corresponds to, whether it is the PSS or the CRS or something else such as PDCCH, PDSCH. The stream of booleans enable the submodules for each physical channel, and then these end disjunct streams, depending on which type of subframe we are building, are built into our final multiplex stream. We can see what this looks like in the code on the next slide. It is also worth noting that the output from the index to channel mapper includes booleans for physical channels that aren't actually implemented in the application framework. This provides an easier framework if you actually want to implement signals such as SSS or PCFICH. So this is what the code generally looks like. As mentioned, there are two main components and therefore two main modules, the index generator and the index to channel mapper. We're gonna go into these in more detail in the next few slides. This is the index generator. As mentioned, the index generator outputs a cluster containing the address of the IQ symbol in the resource grid. The index generator is realized with four different counters. One counts the subcarrier index from 0 to 11, one the RB index from 0 to 99, one the symbol index from 0 to 13, and then finally the subframe index from 0 to 9. Notice that the module returns 1,200 valid indices per symbol trigger. The index generator itself is made up of two fundamental building blocks. The first is the pulse expander, which goes from the start trigger to output a pulse of length 1200 to correspond to the 1200 subcarriers per symbol, and then different counters, which count as high as they need to depending on which part of the IQ address in the resource grid they are keeping track of. This is the code for the index to channel mapper, which is the second main block in the resource mapper. The index to channel mapper takes in the input from the index generator block, which is the cluster that gives us the address of each IQ symbol in the LTE resource grid. The output from the index to channel mapper block is going to be a cluster that explicitly says which physical channel are we referring to. Notice that most, most of the physical channels have explicit mapping modules, whereas implicit mapping exists for the shared channel versus the data channel. This is because adding con new control signals is meant to be easy because the shared channel is configured to just take all the remaining non-special resources. We'll show you what we mean on the next slide. To demonstrate what we mean when we say that most channels have explicit mapping, we opened up the LTE TDD category five PSS mapper block at the top. As you can see, we pull out the timing indices and we look at the subcarrier index, RB index, symbol index, and subframe index. In other words, the address of our resource element in the whole LTE resource grid. In this block, we explicitly are looking for something that is a subcarrier index five, RB index 47, symbol index two, and subframe index one, because we explicitly know based on the LTE standard what this block should be. However, the PDCCH and PDSCH have implicit mapping. This provides us with some flexibility. As we can see in the code at the bottom, when symbol index is equal to zero, we will map that symbol to be a control symbol and everything else will automatically be shared channel. If we change this logic to say equal to zero and equal to one or greater than two or something else, we would then change which channels are configured to be control channels. And by default, all the remaining non-special channels are going to then be the shared channel. If you remember, we actually already played around with this in lesson 3.1, when we changed that equal to zero to be less than two and made the first two symbols control symbols.
Go ahead back and review this exercise so you can remind yourself how this works. Now that we reviewed channel encoding and the resource mapper, let's now review OFDM modulation and how it is implemented in the LTE application framework. These are the four fundamental blocks that implement the OFDM modulator in the LTE application framework. These can be found inside the LTE downlink transmit IQ processing block inside the transmitter loop. The first block is DC insertion. DC insertion inserts DC after 1024 samples and delays the following samples by one cycle. The next block is the Xilinx IFFT, in which the IFFT is performed by a Xilinx IP core. The FFT shift is achieved by inverting every second sample in the time domain. Next is the CP length block. If the physical layer is working with the first symbol, then the CP length block is going to tell us that we need a CP of length 160 samples. For all subsequent symbols, it'll tell us that we need a CP of length 144. This is per the standard for 20 MHz LTE. This then all feeds into the cyclic prefix insertion block. Incoming samples are delayed by 2048 samples. Incoming and delayed samples are combined according to the configured cyclic prefix length. This is what the Xilinx IFFT module looks like. If you look at the source code, you can see that we have the Xilinx IFFT block and then we have a block that performs the FFT shift, and then we have scaling. In terms of how the specific Xilinx FFT block behaves, that documentation is available from the link on the Xilinx website. So you understand the principles of the FFT versus IFFT, review the concepts on this slide. So you can understand this in more detail. In exercise 42-1, let's get to know the Xilinx FFT core better. In this exercise, you will study the behavior of the Xilinx IP core, learn about FFT scaling, and learn about the DC carrier. Okay, so go ahead and open and familiarize yourself with exercise 42-1. Run the host VI with default settings, browse the source code of the host VI, and then browse the source code of the simulated FPG API. Some questions to help you understand. First, what is the latency of just the Xilinx core module? Second, what are the min and max input values that the FPGA module can accept and produce? And finally, what is the dynamic range of the input test data that is created in the host test bench? We will look at the answers to these on the next slide. Here are the answers. The latency of the Xilinx core module is 5,255 clock ticks, which is 7,310 minus 2,048 minus 5 minus 2. In terms of the min and max input values that the FPGA module can accept and produce, for an input, we have a complex fixed point number that has two integer bits and 14 fractional bits which corresponds to a range of negative 1.9999 to positive 1.9999. The output is a complex fixed point with one integer bit and 15 fractional bits, which corresponds to a range of 0 0.9999 to positive 0 0.9999. In terms of the dynamic range of the input test data that is created in the host test bench, this is negative A to A. Some further questions. Investigate the test signal generation in the host diagram and note how the FPGA IFFT and host IFFT have different scaling. Set the parameters N1 to 0 and N2 to 2048. Run the simulation. Check the FPGA and host output for frequency 0. And what do we learn? We can see how this scaling is different if we look at the math script node on the host, which generates the test signal. In this, we can see on line seven how our scaling is different. 
What we learned is that when all subcarriers are occupied, the DC subcarrier significantly exceeds the dynamic range and becomes clipped. That's one of the reasons why the standard specifies to exclude the center subcarrier in the transmission. In section D, we are going to cover synchronization and how it is implemented in the LTE application framework. Now, why do we need synchronization? The challenge is that timing misalignments occur between the transmitter and the receiver. This is due to propagation delays due to things like multipath. The objective, therefore, of synchronization is to determine the start of the LTE frame in the receiver operating window. Note that frequency misalignments are often caused by hardware impairments. Generally speaking, the oscillator between the transmitter and the receiver are not going to be perfectly aligned. Also, we can see Doppler spread if our target is actually moving. The objective, therefore, is to understand and compensate for carrier frequency offset both the integer frequency offset, or IFO, and the fractional frequency offset, or FFO. These are the two type of downlink synchronization signals in the LTE standard. The first is the primary synchronization signal, or PSS, which obtains LTE half-frame timing, estimates carrier frequency offset, and obtains a physical layer identity. The next is the secondary synchronization signal, or SSS. This obtains LTE frame timing, refines the timing and CFO estimates, and obtains the physical layer cell identity group. Note that in the LTE application framework, only the PSS is used for timing and frequency synchronization. So only half frame timing is estimated, and only one PSS symbol per radio frame is used. In the LTE standard, Normally, two PSS symbols are used. This results in 10 millisecond periodicity instead of 5 millisecond periodicity. Also note that in LTE, the base station is the master and the UE is the slave. This diagram shows where the PSS is located. Again, remember, we do not implement the SSS in the LTE application framework, just the PSS. This is what the diagram for carrier frequency offset compensation looks like in the LTE application framework. We are going to go into this in a little more detail. Now we can see how the LabVIEW CDL block diagram maps to the high level block diagram. The first module is the CFO compensation block. Then we have our FFO estimation for autocorrelation and timing estimation for cross correlation. These both then feed into the IFO estimation and then finally into a timing adjustment block with the feedback from the IFO estimation back to the CFO compensation. Note that the timing estimation based on cross correlation is used as input to improve the IFO. Here are some details on the four modules that make up the cross correlation. The first is a low pass filter decimation that has an input rate to the filter of 30.72 megahertz. It extracts the center of 62 subcarriers, and the output rate is 192 kilohertz, so the signal is decimated by a factor of 16. Then is the cross-correlation block, where real and imaginary parts are processed separately, and the coefficients of the FIR filters are the values of the PSS. Then is the peak index peak value and signal energy block. And then finally, the peak validation block, and index wraparound block. It looks at whether the peak is greater than eight times the energy and wraps peak index around radio frame boundaries. This is the theory behind the cross correlation. Note that the peak location is sensitive to carrier frequency offset. 
The true time offset is D equals 1000 samples. We will have peak ambiguity in the case of FFO, and peak shifted by 813 samples in the case of IFO. For more details, see the LC application framework paper, which cites research that went into these specific blocks. In section E, we will cover channel estimation and equalization. Specifically, we will look at the OFDM transmission model, channel estimation, and channel equalization. Channel estimation. All the details on this slide can be found in the folder FPGA downlink RX slash LTE downlink RX IQ processing dot GCDL. In the downlink, there are two types of channel estimation algorithms that occur. There's the cell specific reference signals and then there's the UE specific reference signals, CRS and UERS respectively. By the default, CRS is used for equalization of the PDCCH and the PDSCH subcarriers, and optionally, the UERES can be used for equalization of the PDSCH subcarriers. In the uplink, there is the demodulation reference signals, or DMRS. For the antenna ports, there are virtual ports for data that passes through the same channel, and channel estimates come from different antennas. These are the equations for the OFDM transmission model. In OFDM, it is important to note that data is specified in the frequency domain. These are the equations for channel estimation. It's important to note how having a cyclic prefix affects how we do channel estimation. This is what the CRS LTE channel estimation block looks like. This can be found in the LTE channel estimation CRS.gcdl file, which is in the path you see at the bottom of the slide. Note that this is the example for CRS, but UERS works analogously. If we look at this at a high level, we have data that comes in and we have CRS generation in parallel. Then we have our channel estimator, which then sends data out through linear interpolation and also frequency tracking, from which we get respectively the data channel estimate and also the frequency offset. Note the equation that we are implementing in the channel estimator. We also have some conversions for fixed point precision with our signals having two integer bits and 14 fractional bits multiplied by 10 integer bits and 15 fractional bits which means that we end up having 10 integer bits and 15 fractional bits, um, and then similar type of math on the internal side. Note that we heavily use DSP48 E1 slices. These are explicit pieces of FPGA fabric. Um, there's detailed document and documentation from Xilinx on how to use these. Also, in general, on the FPGA, multiplying binary numbers is faster than division. That's something to note. How this manifests itself is that we convert the division A to B, for example, into the multiplication A times B to the power of 2. Also note that the frequency tracking block at the end detects residual frequency offset between pilots. These are some details on how we do interpolation in both frequency and in time. First, linear interpolation is done in the frequency domain. We do a zero order hold on the edges based on the pilots. And remember, as you know, there's one pilot for every five data. Then we do zero order hold in the time domain. This is what the equations look like for channel equalization with zero forcing. Note that matrix operations in the time domain are replaced by element-wise operations in the frequency domain, as seen in the golden box. This is what the equalization clock-driven logic block looks like. This can be found in FPGA shared slash RX slash 
channel estimation slash LTE channel equalizer dot GCDL. This block makes heavy use of the DSP 48E1 slices as mentioned. Uh, these are dedicated multipliers on the FPGA that are the most optimal way to actually implement multiplication. Here we're using the same trick as before, we're converting element-wise division into element-wise multiplication. And here we can see at a high level what these blocks are actually doing. Note that the first part of the CDL block is just doing some data packing into the right format, and then we can actually see the equations that we perform to get equalized data. In section F, we will cover channel decoding. Specifically, we will do an overview of the decoding procedures and discuss LLR demapping. This is an overview of the decoding procedures. Remember that there is a control channel, which is modulated with QPSK, and a data channel, which is modulated with QPSK or 16QAM or 64QAM in the default application framework. On the decoding side, depending on whether it's the control channel or the data channel, we implement convolutional decoding with tail biting using Viterbi or turbo decoding. Note that in since the 2.0 version of the application framework, and I implemented our own CDL implementations of these, whereas previously we were using Xilinx IP. As you probably know, in OFDM, each carrier transmits a complex IQ symbol, which we denote normally by X. The constellation diagram is typically a way that we visualize these IQ symbols. Within each IQ symbol, several bits, D sub I, are encoded. The total number of encoded bits is given by the modulation order, or mu. Here we are using the variable x hat to denote the IQ symbols after all the distortions, noise, etc. imposed by wireless transmission are removed. You can think of x hat as plotting a single point in the constellation diagram on the receiver side. There are several ways to perform demapping. One is called the hard decision, when the demapper looks at x hat and decides if each bit is d sub 0, d sub 1, if they are going to be a 0 or a 1. What we have implemented here instead is a soft decision, which is LLR demapping, which, as you probably know, means log likelihood ratio. Instead of making a strong decision if the bits are 0 or 1, the demapper will instead return the likelihood or confidence of each bit either being a 0 or 1. And we use a logarithm because it's simpler to calculate this. Note that we are looking at the real and imaginary parts separately, which is why the plot on this slide is one-dimensional. The red bins indicate the ideal bits encoded into that symbol. The number of bins depends on the order of the modulation mu, which we will see in more detail in upcoming slides. The reliability is essentially given by how close x hat is to the center of the bin. It is important to note that the equation here requires the variance of the noise as an input. Right now, we have it hard-coded as a fixed value, but in a real system, you would have a noise variance estimation block in place. Now let's look at this implementation concept in more detail. As inputs, we have x hat, which is our equalized symbol, mu, which is the modulation order, and then 1 over sigma squared hat, which is the noise variance. We then scale the symbols in noise from unit symbol energy to integer. We then detect the bits, whether it's a 0 or a 1, in other words, in which constellation bin is the symbol. And note that we are processing i and q separately. And then we process the bits separately to calculate soft bits. In other words, at this point, we are approximating by distance to the border of the constellation bin. And then we get our output of our soft bits. As mentioned previously, currently there is no noise variance estimation implemented. Remember that it is important that the equation requires the variance of the noise as an input. We fixed hard-coded that into the equation, but in a real system, you would want a noise variance estimation block in place. Also note that for the different modulation orders, these are the values of mu, which correspond to the number of bits, and the value of c sub 1. Here we can also look at, for the different modulation orders, the different bins 
and therefore how we might do the calculation for each. Here you can see the locations for each of the blocks outlined in yellow. Each of these are different sub-clock-driven logic blocks that are going to be in the project. We encourage you to look into these blocks in addition to all of the others to actually see how the math was implemented. We expect that it'll be fairly intuitive to see how the theoretical equation mapped to the implementation on the FPGA.